It's all right. That one in the great beyond did a really, really nice uh, beyond video about rights and responsibility. Really well done. Really well done. Digital literacy is knowing how to use stuff. You would ask me that. I don't have my phone with me. I got told you. She texted me. Oh, um, Lippman. Last name Lippman. Okay. Digital literacy. Do you know how to use stuff? Digital law. Be careful with copyrighted material. Although I told you as teachers, we all have our get out of jail card. It's called fair use. Digital etiquette. Don't be using the internet to scream and yell at people. Although, you know, digital etiquette, I think, has gone by the boards with the way people are using Twitter, etc. Digital communication, do you know how to use your email correctly? Digital commerce, don't be a pirate king like your instructor. And good old digital access. Um, digital, let me just back up for a sec. Digital communication, you do realize your email is not yours when you're in school, right? It is not your email. It is not private. Um, you may think that if you send something from, say, if I send an email to Sarah or to Britt, that they're the only ones who can see it. Not true. Not true. Uh, in my old job, because we really didn't have a lot in place when we first started out with all this, one of the things that fell to me was I would show up at a school with an email printed out in my hand to speak to a principal about something somebody had sent out from the school. So don't ever think that your email is not monitored in school. It is very heavily monitored, as a matter of fact. Um, and that is now a statewide thing. It's not, <clears throat> we in Jefferson County back came late to that dance because of concerns about uh, teacher privacy and, and the JCTA contract, etc. But now the state basically can drop into your email anytime they want to. We talked a lot about uh, ISTE standards, and here they were. Digital citizen, of course, being front and center, but you have to realize where Dr. Matson takes off, and let's go ahead and jump down to her first is she is trying to move us into something called participatory digital citizenship. It is not her term. What's wrong? Oh, he's okay, but he's not coming in. What? He, he's not coming in. He's okay, but he should be in now. All right. Fine. It's not um, something that she made up, but I do like her book because it's very easy to read, and I think it does a good job of arguing to change how we look at all this. So I'm going to put her quote up here. This is straight from the book. Um, and that's where we're going for the rest of the time you're with me. So what we're going to do is we're basically going to take the tack of we could stand and tell kids all day long, do not, do not, do not, shall not, shall not, shall not. But what we really ought to be doing is putting them into situations where they experience digital citizenship activities, and then realize what the best course of action might be. So I'm going to let you watch another little video here. This is another TED Talk. Um, and this one is not going to be, I'll be frank, honestly, it's not going to be as engaging as um, Larry. good old Larry. That's good stuff in that video. I, I, I tell people about that video all the time and say, if you do anything, <clears throat> I don't care what you are, teacher, whatever, you need to watch this video. Because what Larry, I think, puts out well is the fact that we have been changed. The way we look at things has changed. This lady is basically going to talk to you about digital presence. And let me... Let me just give you my take on this, and then we'll listen to her for a while. This idea that we get all upset about kids having phones in schools, I see both sides of the argument. But here's the side of the argument that, that 
I kind of try to get people to listen to is this idea that somehow this is new and extraordinary and we are under threat and all of that. Um, and frankly, when phones first started coming into schools, everything was cool. Everything was just kind of quiet. And when I say phones now, I'm, I'm talking about smartphones here. I mean, we, we, we had policies, procedures about um, use of electronic devices to communicate go way back. And then a little something happened at Eastern High School. It was sexting. Somebody started shooting around pictures. And then everybody went to the walls screaming that, you know, the world had ended. Well, as someone who comes from a generation of uh, the most exciting technology was a 16 millimeter projector and a color television, we texted. We texted in school. It was called passing notes. And the same kind of over the top kind of what are you doing was always in the passing of the note and you were always kind of thought it was cool that you got away with it in a classroom. There were certain teachers that you knew that you could pass notes in class. Um, and of course there was the ultimate sin of taking a test and putting the answers down on your arm and your leg or wherever and then passing that along to your friends. Of course, now we just take pictures of the test. What I'm trying to say is the ideas haven't changed. The form has changed. And that is what's so true about so much of technology is that the ideas behind it haven't really changed. It's the form. And so when we talk to kids today about be very careful about your digital footprint, make sure that people understand who you are. And you, as new teachers, have had it beaten into your poor brains, and this is what she's going to talk about a little bit, about don't put stuff on social media. You know, it's interesting. There's a really good, there was a really good site out there called Social Mention. Social Mention. And you could put your name into that. You didn't have to put an email in. You could put your name into that, and it would pop back and tell you how many times you've been mentioned. Um, businesses use it, obviously. Uh, realtors use it a lot to check on if people are mentioning their name to potential buyers of houses, etc. But it has become so swamped with calls, with people using it, it's, it's bellied up. So there's a great deal of concern about all this. Now let me, I'll let you watch her. I'm not going to go all the way through it. And again, we're going to be in the same thing we did last Friday with the sound here. I haven't checked it, so we'll see if it works. If Britt, if I'm killing your ears, you let me know. Okay, we're good. Raise your hand if you were born between 1977 to 1983. All right, quite a few of you in the audience. <laughs> well, congratulations, you, my friends, are of a very unique micro generation known as Xenials. A Xenial is a person who falls somewhere between Generation X and the Millennial Generations, and they share characteristics of both in addition to sharing a very unique experience. An analog childhood, followed by a deep dive into a digital young adulthood. I am a proud Xenial. I remember being gifted a teen line in my bedroom at just 13 years old, because <laughs> my parents couldn't bear me tying up the phone lines any longer. I remember signing online using an AOL screen name and a dial-up modem to connect with my friends and complete strangers in chat rooms. I am of a generation where in order to use Facebook when it came out in 2004, you had to be a college student with a college or university email address. At this time, I was just 20 years old. 
Another show of hands here. Up high, if you think that at 20 years old, I was the most wholesome version of myself. If your hands are raised, you are sadly mistaken. See, I wasn't a bad kid, but I was exploring my independence. The difference was that for the first time in history, I was exploring that independence alongside my peers in an online space. We were going to parties, posting photos from those parties, and we were leaving comments using rather colorful language to express ourselves. Please remember that at this time, my mom wasn't on Facebook, my baby brother wasn't on Facebook, my grandmother certainly wasn't on Facebook. This was a safe space for me and my peer group to socialize and to communicate. Fast forward to 2006, in a horrifying turn of events, Facebook decides to go public with its platform, leaving me and my peers in a panic. When I try to explain this historical phenomenon to teenagers today, I often say to them, imagine if suddenly Snapchat was like, just kidding, we're going to make your photos available to everyone. <laughs> the kids I say this to gasp in horror as if this thought has never crossed their mind because it hasn't. Kids today aren't using Snapchat as a prime resource for inappropriate tomfoolery, but they are sending lots of photos out into the world of themselves with double chins and cat filters that they likely wouldn't want a significant other or a future employer to see. Today, I work in a public school system. Let's face it, entering education means all eyes are on you and you have to model digital citizenship for your students. When I began teaching, I thought, man, I have got to clean up my online reputation. So I did. I started sifting through old photos, removing tags, and deleting many of them altogether. I went on an unfriending frenzy. I started shutting down old social media accounts that I didn't use anymore. Fun fact, did you know that in order to delete your old MySpace account, you have to sacrifice the blood of your firstborn child? <laughs> Seriously, it is a rigorous process. Um, but there are a lot of things that the person you see standing here today has in common with the 20-year-old version of me. I still mess up in real life and online, but I believe that our online narrative should reflect our true selves. My actual life is not perfectly filtered, and my online life shouldn't have to be either. But I didn't always subscribe to this idea. This photo captures one of the happiest days during the most exciting part of my life to date. This was the day I graduated and earned my master's degree, just two weeks before my wedding day to my very best friend. This was also the spring before I would begin my career as an educator. I would shifted so much of what I posted online and how I thought about how I represented myself in that space that for a moment, I considered not posting this photo at all. See, while we look like two very, very happy young people in this picture, because we were and still very much are, if you take a closer look, you'll notice that in the corner of this photo, there's a cocktail and a pack of cigarettes. I'm not even sure if they were mine, but I feared so deeply that if the wrong people saw this image, that I would be shunned and I could be fired and I would lose my teaching certificate. So I cropped the photo. <laughs> Add this to the list of filtered moments that I began to curate as part of my online narrative. The pendulum swung so much when people my age realized that our digital identities were going to be determined by what we posted on social media, that we really started to give young people the impression that they couldn't ever make a mistake online. Today, adults constantly tell kids they can't ever mess up on the internet or else they're never going to get a job or they're never going to get into college and their lives are going to be ruined forever. 
We've done such a good job planting this seed of fear that instead of helping our children by empowering them to use social media for good, they truly believe that they have the power to destroy their own reputation. The part of a teenager's mind that's responsible for decision making, the frontal cortex, isn't fully developed yet and won't be until they reach their early to mid 20s. Sometimes young people post things mm -hmm. online that they don't even realize will create an impact on themselves or others. Other times they post, click, share, and after the fact, realize that they've done something they shouldn't have. Teaching digital citizens is tough. It's hard to imagine raising them, but after six incredible years of marriage, my husband and I are finally ready to become parents. Everyone tells us how well equipped we'll be to parent during this digital shift, this digital age, but for as excited as I am to have a baby someday soon, I am still riddled with anxiety. I mean, think about it, someday, our hypothetical sweet, tiny little baby will become a teenager. How on earth will we handle screen time and schoolwork and drama and social media and experimentation with drinking and sex and drugs and rock and roll, especially if they're posting about it all online? But wait, this is the first time we've ever done this. Not just my husband and I's impending parenthood, but this is the first time that multiple generations of people are raising digital natives. So we need to help support them. There's gonna come a time in our future child's life when they're going to post something online that is less than acceptable to us. Many of you have experienced this already. When this time comes, we need to help support them by lending an ear to listen. I know, I know teenagers don't always turn to their parents first when they're in a crisis, but they have relationships with adults they trust. If they aren't turning to you, maybe they're turning to a teacher or even a peer that they look up to and that's okay. It still takes a village, so embrace that village. We can help support our kids by educating ourselves and pointing them in the direction of resources available to them to help them manage their online lives. Make them aware of laws that pertain to sexting in the state where you live. Seek out digital literacy opportunities together at your local public libraries. I know this is a tough one, but we need to explore the social media platforms our children are using so we can live in those spaces alongside them, helping them to navigate the waters of digital literacy more responsibly. Is your kid on Snapchat? Create an account, dive in, and let your kid teach you how to use the filters. Connect with them there or in other social media platforms as a quiet follower one who sees what they're doing without interacting or without hovering over their every move. Technology will continue to evolve exponentially, but the most important thing we can do as parents is to set boundaries with our child's media use and their devices. Set screen time limits. Charge their devices in your bedroom at night, not theirs. Don't allow devices at the table while eating or in the car while driving, and that means me and you too, parents. I'm still riddled with anxiety about becoming a parent, but I need to step back, zoom out on my worries, and remember that our parents face challenges too, and their parents before them. So anytime that you posted what, thought, crosses your mind, I want you to pause and think about all the ridiculous stuff you did while your young minds were still developing. No matter what generation you came from, we all experimented with substances, our bodies and ideas as adolescents and as young adults. No matter how much technology has shifted, we need to step back, zoom out on our worries, and remember that raising digital citizens is no different than raising in real life citizens.
Thank you. I like this video because she, I think, does a nice job of kind of um, giving us a real life example of the stuff that we got from Larry. You know, Larry stuff. I what I love about Larry stuff is so grounded. It's so grounded in good data, good science. The problem with this has been. You heard her use the term digital native. She didn't use the term net generation, which is another tall soft line. So the term digital native was actually coined by a guy by the name of Mark Prinsky. Uh, Mark teaches over at Virginia Tech, and he has a whole there's a whole universe that surrounds him. He has a good book out there called The Partnering Pedagogy, where he talks about <clears throat> that we should embrace kids' use of this stuff and then turn it into uh, classroom structure. The problem with all that is the obvious. If you have someone in your classroom who's on the Wi-Fi network for your school, you have control. If you have people in your classroom who are using their phones in your classroom, utilizing the Wi-Fi network in the school, you have control. But how many people do that? You know that. You're probably sitting here right now with your phones, and you're not on the Wi-Fi network here at University of Louisville because it's a pain in the ass to get on. I didn't say that. <laughs> but you get my point. You're sitting on your data plan. So every time we think we have technology corralled, in education, another horse slips out of the barn. So what we're going to be exploring for the next few days, back to the rest of the class, is we're trying to understand what Dr. Matson is trying to, to explain to us. She is also an educator. I tried to find something where you could, I'm a big believer when I talk about people that I should let you hear their voices. Um, Prinsky, you wouldn't want to listen to. The other guy that Don Tapps got is a guy who did the net generation thing, and he was Canadian. Uh, Canada has an enormous wealth of people who have explored the whole uh, impact of technology on our lives. Fascinating. Why Canada? You know, you just kind of go, huh? Oh, why Canada? Canada is the largest user of distance education anywhere in the world. You ever been to Canada? Ten hours by car, you're in Toronto. Right? Hop in your car, go across the, what's it called, the Freedom Bridge there in uh, Detroit, and boom, you're in Toronto. If you then keep heading north, about 20 hours later, you can wave at the polar bears. They give you an idea how big the damn place is. It's a very, very large space. Uh, my friends who live there think nothing about when we go to conferences, you know, <coughs> flying hours and hours to get there. And it's not necessarily because they live over on the West Coast. It's not because they're in Vancouver or something like that. It's just it takes just as long to go north to south as it does, well, not east to west necessarily, but because things are so spread out, you can't just hop in an airplane, go somewhere, then hop on another airplane, go somewhere. Fascinating. You've been doing it forever. So what are we going to do? Well, today we're going to take the first step that I think that Kristen talks about in her book that I find very true with me. And that is we need to let kids know who are sitting in our classrooms that we acknowledge the fact that we live in a very different world than where I came from, very definitely, and even where you came from. You're still older than they are. So she talks about using things like survey tools to find out what kids know or what kids want to know. And the reason I made up the list that's on here is I tried to use all the tools that I have used and that others have used, um, but it also gives you stuff to put into that magical teacher toolbox, which I hope you're starting to collect, that you can then use for the right moment. 
The other thing that we see so often with tools when we're trying to help kids get their heads around technology is we use the wrong tools, frankly. Um, or we might use the right tool, but at the wrong moment. I mean, we just, we have to realize these things are different, even though they might have a label that lumps them all together. We're going to be looking at the following tools today. We're going to be looking at Padlet, frankly, my favorite. Uh, but that's because I'm a very visual person. Visual person, legally blind, leads to a lot of frustration, as you can probably guess. But I love Padlet because I can really design how I want it to look and feel. Now, Padlet will go into the Google Classroom. In fact, everything that's here goes straight into Google Classroom. The problem with it is it goes into Google Classroom as a link. So in other words, you're in your Google Classroom, you click on the Padlet, you go to Padlet, you put something there, and then you come back. The reason why you're doing the wiki thing is because you have that outside space that is also your space that you can have with your kids. One of the things that I've been getting text from folks in our class about is, will you please check and see if you can see my wiki, especially the folks in the great beyond. And a few of them I can't because folks are making a mistake when they go in, you know the default was anyone can see, right? But there's a checkbox in there that it says allow access only to and some folks mistakenly have checked that box. Now, for us, it's a problem because I can't see it. But really, for you in a school, it's great. Because at that point, you have the control that you need over who's going to actually see this. thing. Now, having the wiki gives you a chance to put all of these in there in their native look. So your padlets are live. Your answer gardens are live. And of course, we played with the Mentimeter, so you kind of get it how it works. And then, of course, there's good old Google Forms. How many of you all know Google Forms? Have you ever played with it in your classroom? Okay. We like Google Forms. Um, it was the first flat database besides, um, well, there was a flat database available in the old Apple Works, Claris Works. Uh, and FileMaker Pro. But basically, Microsoft Access took over the database world, just like DBase owned it at one time. Now it's Microsoft and Access. So those of us who aren't looking for a heavy, heavy tool to actually create a way to gather information that we can hang on to, Google Forms is the best because it's flat. It doesn't have a hard learning curve. And the, because the final product easily goes out onto the web as a website. When I used to teach a class many, many years ago about develop content for the web, one of the tools that I used was FileMaker Pro. And the exciting thing about FileMaker Pro was you could create a database that could then be placed upon the web. Now you're sitting there going, yeah, okay, so what? Well, back then that was an exciting ability. But Lordy mercy, it took an hour for you to figure out, no, excuse me, it took a day or two of training for you to figure out and then an hour for you to create it. Google Forms, you're done in click, 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 a few minutes. So what we're gonna do is on this new page that we create in PB Works, and as I've said, you don't have to name these pages what I throw out here, okay? You can name them whatever you want. I'm doing Module 3 because it's easy for me to think of it and I don't have to go too far deep into my brain. But what we're looking at today are survey tools. Now, why surveys? Well, what Dr. Matson talks about in the book is right out of the box. We need to let kids understand that we understand that they're digital natives. We'll never use the term. They use that term in a classroom, they'll fall out of the chair and laugh at me. But we need to understand that we are trying to get them to see 
that we get it. And you do get it. Unless you've been living on a rock for the last 10 years, you get it. I mean, when she made that comment about her grandmother wasn't on Facebook, you now know that's not true anymore, don't you? One of the things that's so terrifying about social media is it has become so dumbed down that anybody can get on it. You know, at one time it was the home of all nerds. Only people who could understand how to type in the right codes could join social media. Now anybody can. People who can't even type correctly can be on social media. Yeah, that's a dig. You have to realize they are going to be wanting to have a place where they can express their understandings either about what do I need to know or about the content that you're throwing at them. Now, you could sit there and say to me, well, that's why we ask for questions, Steve. True. Fair statement. But we also have been beaten up for years now about exit slips, bell ringers, prompts, so on. What a marvelous way to get that out of the way. And remember, this whole conversation from here on out is framed by that first video you watched by Dr. Rosen. If I acknowledge the use of technology right out of the box, if I say to kids through a bell ringer opportunity or just a prompt, tell me what you think about Bill and Blank. Use the language I've been teaching you to answer the following prompt. Yesterday we talked about quadratic formula. What is it about quadratic formula you don't understand? One of the most important things that we can teach kids anything. And I say that in our class, in that beginning hi, welcome to our class, is about metacognition. Thinking about what you think about. You do it all the time. Everybody does. But here's the piece of that we really need to get kids to understand. It's called epistemic agency. Epistemic agency is where you are able to say, this is what I know about whatever it is that we're talking about. It also means this is what I don't know. Could you imagine how easy it is to be a teacher if you could get a room full of kids to be able to do that? Are we willing to do that? We do it all the time. And then we just go right by it. Because kids are afraid. You, know, you don't want to look stupid. So if you can build that kind of classroom that says, it's hey, it's okay. It's okay for you to say, all right, so yesterday we were studying this, and yeah, I have no clue what you just were talking about. Epistemic agency. It is the hardest thing to get a class to do. In all the years that I've been working this technology gig, which is pushing what, Steve? 20 some odd years? I've seen one teacher. One teacher in Greenwood Elementary, right next door to PRP. You'd walk into her fifth grade class, and she was your classic, you know, fifth grade teacher, taught everything on the sun. But every single thing they did in that class, when she got to that point where it was time for kids to do demonstrations of understanding, she then would literally take a step back and she would say, so what don't you know? And her kids, instead of being afraid to ask those or to make those statements, that took her a long time to get there, she told me. It took her the first two months of school and she really had to work at it. So in our wiki space, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new page, which you know how to do. And all we're doing today is I want you to explore these various ways of doing survey. Now, when Dr. Matson talks about it in the book, 
she's talking about it in terms of kids expressing their understandings about things that have to do with digital citizenship. I'm going to give you a lot more freedom than that. So I'm going to ask you to develop a way to get kids to start encouraging kids to express themselves about whatever you're going to do. So if you want to focus this around content, feel free. If you want to focus it around a digital citizenship issue, feel free. If you want to do it something like, what is your best thinking on how we use technology in our class? Feel free. Okay. So I'm giving you that pass. Now, at this point, I'm not showing you anything new, right? What I just did, create a page, go name it. You know, if you want to call it module three, if you want to call it chapter one, I know the modules and the chapters are all out of sync now, and that's okay. Creating a survey tool, whatever you want to call it, you feel free. We also, and I'm doing this for you because you've been with me, but I'm also doing it for the great beyond because what I'm seeing in the great beyond is there's lots of people who are going to wait to the last minute to throw all this together. And I want to make sure they're hearing our process. You know process because we sat in here and did it. You know that when you get this done, this page now has a unique URL, doesn't it? And that unique URL then is what we put over in the live text for this particular module. All right, you ready to go play? Mm -hmm. Let's go play. Steve's put a lot of heavy stuff out there. Let's go have some fun. Let's go look at Padlet. My goodness gracious, I love Padlet. Um, I'm going to give you a gift right out of the box. I don't know why. Well. Okay, I'm going to give you my username and password to get in Padlet. It's not going to get you into my bank account or anything like that. In fact, a lot of the stuff that we play with in this room, I do give you freely my username and password because you're not going to get into anything that's going to get me in trouble. Um, so if you want to play inside a Padlet with my, why would I use Steve's account? Well, Steve's the paid account. Uh, it's paid for with money that, comes from this college so hey it's kind of your account too if you think about it so I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna click on the login button and I'm gonna log in with this right here I don't know if you can see it well SB Swan 02 at Louisville.edu and the super secret password which isn't really all that super secret anymore, is ULIT, all lowercase, ULIT241. That's my office number. So ULIT241. I've only been bitten once by this. Otherwise, someone used it inappropriately. Uh, Padlet, I would not share with kids unless you just want them to have their own accounts. Did you get in? Does anybody try getting in yet? I just want to make sure it's working. Um, when we used to use the Vion, which was called Guanimate in the old days, what we would do is I would say to Brittany, log in using Steve's username and password, but create a Brittany account, and then Brittany could put in kids. You with me? And then kids would log in, and all they would see is Brittany. Well, we're going to have another one like that this week. It's called Storybird. And just like I promised you with Vion, especially my language people in here. If you don't find Storybird makes you go woohoo, start rubbing your hands together. Uh, in Storybird, you're going to log in as me because again, you get access to everything. But within the Storybird, if you want to, you can create a class account and you can have kids go into it and let them do amazing work. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So at Padlet, we log in. And the first thing it wants to do is it shows you all the Padlets. And look at this. It'll do notifications. So what would that mean? If you get your own free account, now obviously who's going to get the notifications here? <laughs> but if you use this with kids with a free account, it'll still do notifications. So therefore, if you had the Padlet sitting somewhere, Google Classroom, Wiki, Google Sites, by the way, you know, if you wanted to use Google Sites as a web page connected to your classroom, 
Oh, everything we're playing with, why? Okay. I find sites is a little too fussy. I don't like fussy. I like simple. Okay. So what I would do is, kid goes in and puts a, a sticky note on the Padlet. You get it. You get a notification that they've done this. And as you see, as we work our way through it, you can really turn up the security on your Padlet so that if stuff is going on with it, you'll know. So I'm going to go ahead and say yes, allow. And over here on the left-hand side, I'm going to make a Padlet. Now, this is where personality traits come into play. <laughs> you are the anal retentive type. You might want to have your Padlet to be extremely locked down and organized. If you're a ping pong brain type, you might allow them to have a canvas where you just scatter things everywhere and anywhere. You can have, if you're the anal type, you'll do the wall. In other words, it's brick-like. It just sort of across the thing. Grid, again, you're locking it down. Stream. Stream, I find streams are very difficult to, for kids to mess with because they got to do a lot of scrolling up and down. Okay? And they don't like it very much. Shelf. You get the idea. In a shelf, I can have a shelf that says... What do you know? What do you want to know about this? What do you know about this? Your drag to slip. Okay, so you can build that kind of separate it out. Back channels. Back channels are cool because you could have your Padlet running live up here and people can talk. In other words, it's Sarah could be talking to Britt, then I could be talking to them. Chad could be talking to Ashley. You know, everybody in the room could just chat, chat, chat back up there. If you got uh, Chromebooks, back channel is really interesting to watch. And the brave teacher, the smart teacher, will have the Padlet running live. Right. In other words, it's up, it's up there in class. Again, the argument would be if I had this in that wiki and I had what I was doing for the day up on the screen, but then I had a tab open over here and every once in a while I would just drop over here into it. Just let people know what they're saying. Let's see what the group is thinking about. Click. Are you going to the prom? I mean, you know, <laughs> you get it out there in the open. You can pick a template, in other words, where it does everything for you. And all you're doing is putting the content in here. This is the difference between the free and the paid account, by the way. Okay? Well, there are templates in the free account. They're just not, you know, not very cool. All righty. Now, I'll go ahead and grab the wall. You grab whatever you want. And the first thing it does is says, hey, I'm starting your Padlet. Now, here's where you get to start designing things. As you have probably guessed, I enjoy this part of teaching. I enjoy the design aspect of putting together uh, what I do. And right away, I look at that and I go, uh-uh, ain't going to happen. Don't like that one little tiny bit. So the first thing I can do is by coming over here, I can change up all of this, my swanky wall made with an open mind, all that kind of stuff. I, I am not interested in any of that look whatsoever. And so I can come up here to the little gearsy thing. And when I click on the little gearsy thing, excuse me, the gear icon, you can see now that I've got the ability to modify just about everything that's in front of me. So I can take out the my swanky wall, the description, et cetera, et cetera. So, my swanky wall could be turned into chapter one. Spanish verb conjugation? Would that be fair? Okay. All right. you, you get what I'm doing. I'm putting in the big picture up here. And then my description is where I can, I can 
put in that prompt. Now, if your prompt isn't something simple, and I think that's a disservice. We've taught people that prompts ought to be, you know, what is your thinking about two plus two? Really? You can make your own Padlet note that can be as detailed, full as information as you want, that can be your starting point. So up here, your title could be, here's our cool survey tool description might be let's use this to understand how we want to operate with technology interface you know and then the padlet note that you create would be the deeper dive so maybe that description might read read my padlet note okay you're playing could you come back to this and mess with it of course and to the point that Marco so eloquently pointed out, our first day in here, was stuff that you create in these tools that you then put into your wiki space. You go back to the original content of that tool and change something. What does it do, Marco, over in the wiki space? Update. You update. So I could keep this one format, this one Padlet thing, Come back into it, change the title, change the description, it changes over here. So I don't have to mess with, you know, doing all the copy paste stuff. Okay, I will change this because that swanky wall is driving me nuts. Okay, so I'm just going to call mine, let's talk, dot, dot, dot. Who's my English person in here? You aren't, should I? What's the dots? What do they call that? Ellipse. Yeah. Drives my son crazy because I'm an ellipsis attic, I guess you'd say. I'll keep them made with an open mind. Now, if you want to put an icon on it, you know, go for it. They're, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, they're kind of like kitty cats and, you know, sports, etc. You know, go for it. You can put a unique link to your address. Why is that? Or to your Padlet? That's your Google Classroom feature right there. Okay? That's how you can get this into Google Classroom. We're going to go even further than that. Now let's get down here to wallpaper because this thing's driving me nuts. So I'm going to go down to wallpaper. Oh, let me show you this one, guys. Look at this. You can put a... <laughs> I don't know why you'd use it, but it's just so cool. I just think that is so cool. But you've got a ton of choices down here. If I were doing social studies stuff, you better believe I'd throw this map up here. You know, uh, you better believe I'd be using some of this. Um, and again, this is the difference between the paid and free account. You get a lot more of these. Okay. Notice what the wallpaper does allow you to do. Add your own. Uh, I taught Padlets to a young lady who teaches over at Homestead North. I hope she's going to stay there. Um, fast, fantastic social studies teacher. And so when she was doing her um, explorations into South America, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, she always made sure that she had a Padlet that had the map of whatever country she was talking about. Not a lot of detail on the map, just enough so the kids start making connections when you start talking about rivers and oceans and stuff like that. Um, and they used it. She did one when she was doing her Central America stuff and South America stuff. And of course, you can guess what happened. The kids were literally putting their padlets. They were allowed to move them around. They were putting their padlets on top of the country they came from because North has lots and lots of ESL kids. Okay. Am I beating this to death or are you with me? With you? Okay, so now we have attribution. You're going to put the author's name in it? Okay. 
You're doing this with kids, you better. <laughs> Here's a good allow viewers. Oh, sorry, I should be going down this line here. So we can do the one with attribute. We can do the one where they can move their thing around. So in other words, if you're using one that's locked in. Comments. Thoughts on comments? If you turned it on, what's going to happen? Yeah, we're going to be commenting on each other's tablets. Now, maybe that's what you're shooting for. Maybe that's what you're shooting for. Yes, dears. So I, I've used this before, and I had to like do some guidelines to just make it kind of. That's where I was going. Um, and then I see that you can like you know fix it to where there's like curse words and stuff like that. But I did have to actively like monitor and be like, oops, this has got to go, and this has got to go. And I started like deleting stuff or like making some annoying stuff where they just like copy and paste over and over again. So, it's it's a pain, isn't it? Yeah, we had to come up with some. I, I don't just please don't think I'm up here, you know, going, I don't know what you're like. I do, okay? Yeah. But I also would argue back, and I'm not arguing with Jennifer Rock, I'm just saying, this is a wonderful digital citizenship moment. No, I love it. Yeah. I'm just saying, or let me be more clear. What kind of, so if you use this in the classroom, because my stuff kind of works, but like I'm open to more suggestions in terms of how to make this work best in the classroom. So when we first talk about a Padlet, yeah. That's going to be the first conversation, isn't it? Yeah. This is a public space. Everything you put in it, we're all going to see. Mm -hmm. I, this is the hardest thing, I think, for kids to get, is they don't understand public spaces. Mm -hmm. How many of you have gone into a Twitter? I have raised my hand. How many of you have gone into a Twitter feed and put something in there in reply to something you've seen from someone who you just can't stand, or what they've said, you just can't stand. Am I careful about what I say? I have a trending meme that I created out there. It's called Carpetbagger Bevan. Look it up. <laughs> now, those of you who teach social studies, right away, you're sitting there going, good use of the term, Stephen. <laughs> and the first tweet I put out there what did I do? I put out what a carpetbagger, by definition, meant, and then slapped it on. Yeah. Now, you can argue that that's a public space, Stevie. Yes, but I, would, I did it fully aware. Whereas kids will put FU in and not even think a, a thing about it. So I agree with you. This is rife for misuse. All the stuff we're playing with today. No argument about it. But then when you get down here to content approval. So if it's your Padlet and it has your account, in other words, your teacher email account associated with it, it will then send you the comments before they get posted. I've used this tool. Um, I've used this tool with lots of kids and lots of classes. The one thing that teachers complain about is they get all these emails. <laughs> I get it. And then, of course, you can filter the profanity. All right. This is where, if you really want to get into this, you can actually go out and buy a domain that would be yours that you could use with your Padlet. We're not going to be able to do that. So now I'm going to go ahead and save this. Remember Marco's rule. We're going to call it Marco's rule from now on. In later classes, Marco, I'm going to call it that. Marco's rule. You can always come back in here and change it up. And wherever it lands, it updates. I'm going to close that out. Now I'm going to share it. Again, notice the power here. You can add people to it so you've got it locked away. But that's still not going to stop kids from saying stupid things, is it, Sid? They're going to still say stupid things. So here we go. This is where we're playing next. Down here, we can have choices. 
course, copying the link to the clipboard is how you can get it over into the Google Classroom. Does anybody use QR codes? I do sometimes. Do you? Yeah. Is it, is it, the reason why I ask is I notice it's used a lot in um, math classes, right? They'll put up QR codes around the room, kids walk up to them, and then it, it takes them to a link, et cetera, et cetera. QR codes are one of those things that kind of came and went so fast, you were like, what? Yeah. You know? But that's why I say it. Let's look at embed. So here we go. Here's our old friend, the embed. We're going to come down here, and again, it does a nice job of saying, oh, my God, there's a ton of text here. But if you just copy it, Bing, now I've copied it to my clipboard. I'm going to go over here, and let me go ahead and set up my page. I'm going to create the page. And now to get this thing in here, I want to insert html javascript because that's what it is and then i'm going to paste that go away grammar i'm going to paste that in here last step i want to make sure i check that okay just about everything we play with you'll need to make sure you do that And then I'll do a next. And if there's a problem, this is where it will bark at you. Okay? So I'll say insert the plugin. And if I save it, I now have a Padlet live and on my wiki. Say again. You with me? Yeah. Right. This is like, you don't even have to click on the link. It's just there. Yeah, it's just there. Now, you'll notice there's two ways that you can put stuff into Padlet. First way is this little plusy sign down here. And the second way is just double click on the screen anywhere you want. So if I put a note in to Padlet, Sydney's ahead of me. Good for you, Sid. And I'm going to put a title in it. Look at what's below it. You can upload stuff. I can put a link. Now, when I do this with teachers in another class, one of the things that we're trying to do here is we're having kids creating stuff over here in this other thing. And then the Padlet becomes our gallery wall. It just becomes a platform for our stuff that we create. There's the Goog. What did you do to get your Padlet in there again? You did insert. Mm -hmm. Can we go back and show you again? So I'm back over here and I'm in edit mode. Remember, you always have to be in edit mode. And then I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to go over to the insert, drop down to where it says HTML JavaScript. Make sure you put that check in that box. Otherwise, it's just going to throw the text in, you know, the, the words. You with me? Yeah. Is that only for, like, things like Mentimeter and Padlet? And then you save it once it gets off. Like if I'm in Google form, will it do that? Yeah. You're getting ahead of me. Let me show you how to do it. Okay. I mean, Google Forms you can do straight in your classroom, right? That's you don't even need to move it to a wiki space. That's and that's probably where I, frankly, that's where I would probably come down, is I'd keep it in the Google Classroom if you're going to use the survey tool from yeah. uh, their forms. Because there's so much you can do in forms now. Boy, when it first came out. Are we good on Padlet? Yeah. Okay. Now, again, don't take my... Oh, I forgot to show you the other things. 
don't take my um, love for this, you know, as like, oh, Steve wants me to use the Padlet because he's so in love with it. No, not really. Okay? I just want you to see what's possible out there. Also notice that when you own the Padlet, you're the only one who can delete. So again, back to Sid's excellent point. You got kids in here doing stupid things. And if I put them in Sydney, in other words, if I say you're a part of our Padlet group here, yeah. don't do something stupid or I'll toss you up. In other words, I wouldn't just let it be a public free-for-all. God help you if you did that. Because anybody who has access, here's, here's, anybody who has access to your wiki, and right now your wiki is obscurity through, is, is security through obscurity. In other words, nobody knows it exists. But we all know how school is. We're doing this cool thing, and yeah, what is it? Well, we got this Padlet thing. Oh, where is it? Well, it's on her wiki. Now you see where I'm going. Next thing, all of a sudden, your Padlet has peanut butter and jelly messages throwing up all over the place. <laughs> Classrooms are funny. They had their own cultures. You ever notice that? You know that. Period one is so different from period four. You just hate period one when it comes to the door, and you just know I'll get to period four and I'll be fine. <laughs> it gets to the point where it's even as deep as period one has their own uh, vocabulary. Their own language. Uh -huh. Yes, classic example of tribalism for all of you social studies types sitting up there. You ready to try another one? Again, let me emphasize how many of these do I have to put into my little module thingy I'm doing today? Uno. Okay. What's one in French? Okay. It's dua. And no, it's not right. I used to know it wasn't Russian. I haven't used Russian in so long I can't remember anything. You ready to move on? Let's go look at Answer Garden. Why do we like Answer Garden? Answer Garden is light. It is uh, easy. And as you can see here, I, I don't need a Stevie Swan, SB Swan 02, Louisville.edu to get in. I think it's make one. So Answer Garden is that classic example of that back channel that Padlet kind of waved at. This one is just a super cinchy way of letting people crowdsource. So I'm going to come down here to where it says create an answer garden. We're right. Topic required. So there you go. Okay. Look down at the other options you have. You can do a brainstorm. Which is, you throw everything in the kitchen sink. Classroom. Moderator. Again, do our point. Under moderator, I get it back. And then, of course, lock, meaning you're not going to be able to get anything. It has a Twitter-like feel, tweet-like feel. You can limit the number of, you know, 20 to 40. Uh, I always go with the, you know, the higher one. Uh, I can <laughs> set it up with a password if I want. Eh, eh, eh. Spam filter. I turn that one on. Uh, case is up to you. And you'll know that it does have a time limit on it, which I think is nice. That sort of <laughs> brings down the 
oh my god moment. So I could just have it running for the one hour of that period that I have for that day. So I'm going to create it. Got it? How simple can it be? Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. It's that simple. Okay. Do the same trick we did before. Make sure you put that little check in that, you know, this is uh, JavaScript, whatever, whatever. I probably should have organized these better, so I apologize. But Mentimeter, Answer Garden kind of fit into the same space here in the sense that they are crowdsourcing. And if you look at it through synchronous mode, lens, right? You're, you're actually doing it in real time. Whereas Padlet can be, Padlet can be so many different things. You know, the Padlet can be a repository of what kids are thinking about or what they've learned, exit slip, or the Padlet can be the gallery walk. It can be the final location of something that kids have created over here and other tools. The Padlet could look like list all the words that you've learned in class today. Or Spanish or French or whatever. And by the fact that Brittany is the smartest person in Sarah's class, and so her list of her words are going to be like this long. And Steve, who sits there and struggles with hola, let's see, what does that mean? Okay. But he can see Brittany's list and realize that there are a lot of words that I better get up to speed with because she knows them without it being a stressful test like situation. All right, let's dive into Mentimeter. And again, if you want, uh, I would create a free account for this. Now, Mentimeter is definitely made for the synchronous environment. Okay. Although what you created, and you've seen a Mentimeter, we did it the first day of class. So you can have one that hangs around. But really all it's going to do is you're going to create a presentation. And as a part of the presentation, you can do the Mentimeter. So what do you think you could do then? Because you have them, they've given you all these canned presentations to use in your class. Pull it into this and then have one at the end. Have a Mentimeter at the end that basically says, so what do we know? Mm -hmm. What do we got? If you have three one, you can only have two questions. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's its limitation. I would agree. Because I like the way it looks. I do too. Now, on this one, um, you know, if you want to try the ULIT 241 Stevie, oh my God, we got the keys of the kingdom. Yeah. Go for it. But I, I don't know what it would give you, frankly, over just a free account. I, I don't know, to be quite honest with you. But look where it starts up here. It starts with a new presentation, a new folder. So if you wanted to create folders to structure your use of it, because you already have either dictated by your department, your PLC, whatever, a set of PowerPoints, well, you can put them in these different folders and that way you have everything nicely organized. I think, I think, I haven't tried it yet, so don't quote me on it. But I think I can put this over into the Google Drive and then slam it over into here. But let's just go do a new presentation. 
And I'll give it a title. Create the presentation. Look familiar, doesn't it? Very much like a PowerPointy thing. Oh, and down here in the bottom, it's got a little button that says import. And it's stopping me. So there we go. We're done. <laughs> go back and tell your school y'all to buy one of these. So at this point, you know how you could do it, though. I could go in here and go over to, I'd have my PowerPoints opened over here. What would I do? Just copy what's on the slide and bring it over here and drop it into this. Notice it has all kinds of different ways that you can use this. So this is like, and you I'm sure you've heard of this one because I, every school I ever walked into, especially middle and high school, Kahoot. Yeah. So this is a more sophisticated Kahoot. You know, Kahoot is basically put a, put a thing up on the screen. Kids use the code on their phones and they, they basically can be engaged in this side of the room and versus this side of the room, which gets really interesting in some schools. Um, and you can decide how you want to do it. The one that we did when we first came in was right there. I'm sure you recognize it. Good old word cloud. Okay. And then up here, you see it gives you the code that you would use in your classroom. So now this is associated with your little word cloud thingy that you're making. I've got templates here if I want to use a different look for things. There is a word cloud one in here. So, I mean, why do I need a word cloud template? I, I kind of know what templates are. And so here would be my question. What do you think when you, I don't, I'm stumbling here, folks, when you use your phone? I'd probably change that to what word do you think of when you use your phone? Yeah. And again, we've got filter pro, uh, profanities here. <laughs> do, do we do we still do trading the profanity in Spanish and French like I did in my Russian class? We were all about teaching each other the various. When I took Russian here at the University of Louisville, uh, I was in a room full of people, immigrants from Ukraine. So I'm already right this far behind it'd be like having a your spanish class and all the kids in there from central america or mexico so what they ended up teaching me was all the the idioms and the ups and the profanities of russian it's great and i used to get invited to all the ukraine parties too good stuff i learned the dangers and beauty of vodka Okay, now, you got all this to play with. You can customize things. You can have an image. I hope I'm not going too fast. I think you're smart enough you can kind of flip through here. And there it is in all its glory. We are now presenting it in live, glorious. Okay. It even gives you a little thing here to do. That's kind of cool. I saw this used at a faculty meeting here in the College of Education. It was hilarious to watch. First of all, the new dean told everybody to take out their phones. That was interesting to watch. Um, and then when they said, go to this minty.com and put in this code. That was interesting to watch. You could definitely tell the senior faculty from the younger faculty in the room. And then when all the words started popping up on the screen, 
How did you do that? What was that? How am I going to get this over to where I want it to go? Anybody figured it out yet? I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> I really am. I know how to do it. I had just forgotten how to do it. Okay, it is, no, that's the results. That's a duplicate. That's a move presentation to a folder. Oh, darn. All right, let's open it back up. And we say, there it is. No. No, that's not it, Steve. Okay, back in here. Configure. Dun, 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 dun. There it is. Okay, senior moment over with. So it's under configure, share and export. The so you have to decide how long you want it to last. There's the links. You get all that. Then down here, there's our code to put in. Okay. So I'll click on that. It'll copy my code. I can go out here to the PB Works once again. Um, remember the trick that Stevie taught you first day. Return, return, return down the side so it's easy to put stuff in. And I will go to insert HTML JavaScript, paste in that code, making sure I use the right shortcut. There we go. Make sure I check the box. Do a next. Insert the plugin. Do a save. So again, when this is in the class, and I'm, I apologize for that senior moment, you know, when it, when it comes in to your wiki like this, of course, what are the kids doing? They're going to the menti.com, and then you've told them what put in, and then what they start putting in at that point then starts showing up there. Okay. Realizing you only got seven days for the thing to be alive. And I did a little research on that because I was just really curious. And it's, it's, you could probably guess what it is. They don't have the kind of space, right, to keep all these things. So that's why they did that. All righty. Can you save them to someone? You can save your presentation. Yeah. So if you get your own account, Matt, you can have all the presentations. Okay. And then all you have to do is... You know, so for 2019, I created all these presentations to go with all the stuff, right? And then if I want to use them again in 2020, I go back in and go, I want to use this presentation, customize, change the thing again, turn it on. Let me make sure we get that because I feel bad that I screwed that up. So I create something in here. And when I'm done, I can go over here to configure. From the configure, then I can basically decide how I want it to look. And then I can then get the code, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK, share and export from configure. I can then tell it I want it to last two days, seven days. If I want to go straight from my Google Classroom, direct access will do that. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if it'll take me to it live and I don't have to use my code or not. Somebody want to throw it in there and check that. Uh, share this link to your presentation. Oh, so there's your workaround. 
I can just take that and put it into my PowerPoints that I've got already. And then poof, I've got the ability to jump over into a into view. You know, so we keep working through the PowerPoint, PowerPoint at slide five. Check for your understandings. Go to this, you know, link in, boom. This is assuming everybody's got a device, which falls under the digital citizenship element of digital access. And then, of course, there's your code. Last one. We like Padlet because it's so visual. We like Answer Garden because it's so simple. Yes, Matthew? This goes back to what you were just saying about digital access. What if, well, I'm, in, I'm in Butler and we have no technology in the classroom besides, I mean, I've got a desktop computer. The kids have phones. But, uh, so now the question becomes do we do that? Do we do that conversation around if I allow you to use your phones? Will you sort of sit? Could we use phones and be safe? Does the school allow us to use phones? Where are you? I mean, there are kids that their parents don't let them bring their phones. To yeah, school. yeah, yeah. Where are you? Butler. Butler. Well, you're working under the traditional umbrella that has, you know, its own way of doing things. But you're young, so I'm here to stand here and look at you and say, five years from now, every school will have a one-to-one. -one. So this is something you'll be plowing away in your back pocket. So when that conversation comes up at Butler, we're going to have Chromebooks for everybody. Matt's going to get up and go, let me share something with you that I learned from this idiot back in the <laughs> summer of 2019. Wait, do you... Was that a statement of like, you're sure? Like, you really think that in the next five years? Yeah. Really? Yeah. No way. I'm yeah. sorry. They have to see that. I'm sorry. The gentleman's name is Kermit Belcher. I'm talking JCPS now. Okay. okay. That's all I'm talking about. Yeah. The gentleman's name is Kermit Belcher. He is your new technology god. And then his people. Heather, she does all the Google Classroom digital backpack. Yada, yada. So think about it for a second, Marco. If we're going to give every kid a digital backpack, can I give them a tool to make it? Yeah. Okay, do you? Yeah, it may look like, now let me, let's kind of walk this a little bit first. It may look like, you know, the kids go into school and pick up their device, right? But I don't think it's going to look like like what a lot of schools look like right now, which is uh, Mrs. Smith goes and gets the cart and rolls it into the classroom, and then we waste all kinds of time to get the cart plugged in, and oh my God, they're not charged. We've done that model, and it doesn't really work. Humble thing. So now the question is, what do we try? Well, right now they're trying the iPad one-to-one, -one, right, at North and other places. And that's an extremely expensive proposition. The only way they're, the only reason why they're doing it is somebody else is footing the bill. That's Verizon. If they're picking up the dime. Mm -hmm. Now, on the Chromebook side of the world, the state is all in. The state is all in. And if we could do the Peter Pan thing where I could take you by the hand and we could fly, I could take you to school districts across the state where we're already at. One to one. Of course, you're going to look at me and go, yes, yeah, Steve, there ain't enough kids here. <laughs> I mean, there's more kids at Butler than there are in the school district, right? I mean, and that's a fair, that's a fair criticism, I agree. But what's happening, though, is because we started out in these little tiny districts like this, what we're gaining is the understanding about how to do this as we get it bigger and bigger out there. We did the same thing with Wi-Fi. No, what were you going to ask me? I was going to say, do you know what percentage of JCPS schools are one to one? To one? Hmm. Very small right now. Yeah. Very small. I mean, like less than Because we have it. What they're waiting on, I hope, and I don't know that one for sure, but what they're waiting on is for the data to come in from out in the state where this is a real deal. Okay. Where would I go look first if I were looking for models out in the state eminence? 
I'd land in him and I'd drive down there tomorrow. And I would just camp out. They built that really nice fancy school, right? That's where that's at. Why eminence? Well, two, two, three reasons. Number one, they've had a long history of technology use. Number two, they have a guy there who's the instructional person, the academic person, who is very technology focused. So, and by that I mean he's not the kind of person, or she's not the kind of person who's just going to go and get, you know, the latest cool thing, like iPads for every kid. I'd no more get an iPad for a kid than a man to man. <laughs> and I'm an Apple fanboy. Okay, but I would not do that for love or money. They're too damn expensive. Now, a Chromebook, I can go out and buy a perfectly good Chromebook for what, $150, $200? Yeah. yeah. Why, why would I not? You know, probably be looking at the ruggedized ones. You know, in other words, what happens when you push it off the table? Yeah. Simple enough to do. So, in eminence, I'd go and look and see what the issues are. In Jefferson County, I, hell, I'd go and look at her school at night. I'd start identifying schools. I wouldn't go to his school, even though his school might be one to one, because he's got a different kind of kid than's over there at night. No offense. Well, no offense. Okay. That wasn't meant in terms of racial or socioeconomic. Oh, okay. These kids over here have the sort of damage that he's hanging over their head. <laughs> as they do in Mayo and as they do other places. So it's 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 coming. I mean, it's coming. What's going to happen is once we get out of this kind of funk that JCPS is in right now, the state looking over their shoulder, um, all this other stuff is just waiting in the wings. I mean, you know the kids already have how much storage space in their Google drives. Let's put it this way. They can put three full-length movies in. How about that? In the state... The state, being the good people that they are, you have some of the best people in technology who work at KDE, humble opinion. They're, they're good friends. But they have been building quietly this extremely robust network that's going to allow us to do some really amazing things within that five-year window that I gave you. Yeah, soon and later, probably. Do I need to do Google Forms? Are you okay with Google Forms? Do you want to see Google Forms? Can you just show us how, like, we just do the same thing when we input it, like insert. Yeah, let me show you. HTML. Let's just do it. So we'll do forms.googly.com. And you know you can do this from inside a Google Classroom. Do you want me to do it that way or you want me to do it this way? Just do it Okay. What is your favorite thing about it, Brittany? Um, the fact that I just use Google Classroom, so it's super easy, and it gives them instant results, and they can keep it, I can keep it. I agree, agree, agree. The only other thing I'm going to add to that is that Sheets is running behind it, right? Oh, yeah. So you've got a spreadsheet that's running behind it. So if you wanted to get really uber creative, you could go into that spreadsheet behind it, add some other language, so that when a kid comes in, you can start doing tabulations. Yeah, I also like that you can make like I use it for like practice tests, so yep. then they can see how many they got right, yep. how many they got wrong. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think the Google Forms is one of those things that, and I don't know what your all's training looks like for Google Classroom, but to me, it's that's a day's worth of training because all the There's power. So much on Google Classroom. Yep. It's just one of the best things that are out there with the Google world. Boy, what happened? To me? I didn't touch that. Let me close down some windows up here because I got so many open right now. So the Google Forms, they start with being really nice to you. Um, Google Forms comes under the heading of don't need to recreate the wheel people if you go out onto the interwebs and you just type in practice test google forms 
then all you have to do is take it and put it, put your data, your questions, your stuff into it, and it becomes yours. Hi, Adblock. Why are you jumping up all of a sudden? All right. Adblock doesn't like me. All right, so I'm going to, let's do assessment since we're talking about it. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to pull up a template on assessment. And it's going to load it in. And it's just going to be sit back, Steve, and just put in stuff. And it, you realize assessment and survey are synonymous, right? It does the same thing. Just because it's a quiz doesn't mean it can't be a survey. This is one of the things when I train people right here about Blackboard, it drives me nuts because I'll say, you can go into Blackboard and use the quiz thing to make a survey. Uh -huh. Yeah, same thing. It's the same process. So let's see what that might look like. I you did? I did. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> so the first thing I did, I went up there and changed the name from assessment to survey. And then right below it, it says, hey, what do you want to put in here? So I'm going to take away the ellipso text. That's another technical term, by the way. And I'm going to put in here, let's, ellipso text. That little That all, it's, look at it sometime, you'll see it all is the same. No matter, I don't care what platform, whatever you're using. Let's discover, now we use technology. Okay, and now I come down here, and this is where you're going to put your name in. I'll leave it, right? This is how I can find out who's talking to me. Uh, I might put in here, uh, let kids put their email in there, because they all have it. Uh, I'll come up here, and my first question, I may want to change what it looks like. And so I'll say up here, do to uh, Matt's point. Do you have, oh, come on, Steve. Do you have a phone? Would we want to know what kind of phone it is, man? Yeah. I put that on uh, yeah. Now. Would you really? I put Apple, Android, or other. Okay. Would you make it a separate question or just leave it here? I did, but. How about we make a separate question? Yeah. yeah. Let's make a second. Okay. Then I'll say what kind, and do we go any further than Android or iPhone? I don't think so. Now, you know, I like check boxes. I like check boxes. Now, if you want to get all nerdy and your kids get all mad at you, you can put iOS. Okay. <laughs> How about we just put iPhone? Now, so far, I don't have any Microsoft people in the room who are ranting and raving at me about, you do realize there was a Microsoft phone at one time. What would that be called? That's a good question. <laughs> was that the Pixel? No, Pixel's the Google. Pixel's the... Nokia was always an Android. The only other phone, the only other platform that was totally different was the Microsoft can't remember, and then of course uh, Blackberries. I had a uh, I have a uh, first cousin who is a big wheel. He keeps on turning. Proud man. No, I'm sorry. He's a big wheel, and to this day, and to this day, he only uses Blackberries. You know, they went away for a little while, then they came back. It's fascinating. I asked him once, why are you using a BlackBerry? Because it's the most secure phone there is. You know where their security is located? I'm going off track, and I'm sorry. This is another story, and Brittany is supposed to stop me from doing this. Do you know where BlackBerry, you don't know what I'm talking about. There's got to be somewhere where people save this stuff, right? You know where BlackBerry saves all their stuff, their content? Did you use when you're on a BlackBerry? Saudi Arabia. Oh. That's random. Isn't that interesting? That's not a slap at Saudi Arabia. I'm just saying, you know, in BlackBerry is a Canadian country, that was like a company that was. And so you, you're like, whoa, huh? 
why aren't you in the AWS? Why aren't you in you know, server farm here in, in Canada or the US? No, it's in Saudi Arabia. Because supposedly they have the best security anywhere in the world. Saudi Yes, supposedly. <laughs> I had a supposedly there, Mark. <laughs> okay, so we know how to do this. Uh, do they do Likert scales? Let's see here. Multiple choice grid. Oh, there it is. There's the Likert scale. Okay, Britt, have you are you going to tell us how you uh, get this out of here? You mean like oh yeah. over to oh yeah. your wiki? The little linky link or the embed. You just click on that, and there's your code. I was dumb, and I did the link. Copy that, put it in, I make know. sure you check the box. Comes in. Let's finish up the day. So in module three, we're taking our first tentative steps into this book. Uh, basically, what we're trying to do in Chapter 1 is she's making the argument for we need to understand our students' understandings about technology use. And if it just comes down to don't put that phone out on the desk or it's mine, then you're in a war for the rest of the school year. Just get used to it. If we can crowdsource and have people feel like they're involved in this process, then we can start making the sort of good teacher directions like Sydney was talking about. When you're using a tool like this, here are the rules, people. we got to have some rules. Unfortunately, kids don't see those rules being applied out there in social media these days. And that's another whole discussion we'll have when we go into the sewer on Friday and play with Twitter. Britt just asked, do we have to have a Twitter? Good, good question. Um, after class is over, go in and delete it. I still have my Twitter account. But I'll tell you, Brittany, I had a Twitter account called uh, Swan ULIT here at this place. And I had a, I had a meeting with not this dean, not the former dean, the former, former dean. And they told me I could not have a Twitter account. They, did, they felt like I was not represent, that I could not represent the College of Education. And I said, it doesn't say College of Education, it says Steve Swan, you know, professor, blah, blah, blah. So I took it off. I mean, you, you pick your battles. Right. You pick your battles. Um, yeah, don't worry about it, babe. Would, what I want to show you is you can build a walled garden inside of Twitter. You can build a walled garden. And when you get to that part, what she's going to argue with you is that kids need to see this to understand what the issues are. She's not advocating everybody go out and have a Twitter account. I agree. With her. I agree with her. So, Matson is trying to get us to understand we've got to get kids involved right out of the gate. First thing she wants to do is she wants to talk about a survey tool or a tool to kind of get kids to be able to enunciate what they understand about technology use or what they want to understand about technology use. I gave you the pass that if you want to use it as a way of crowdsourcing about your content or about things you do in class, feel free. We showed you four tools. And again, I told you they do not have to be all four represented over there in your wiki space. You can pick one. We played with all four. We see the similarity between all four in the sense of 
using that magical embed code that gets it live. That is to me the greatest problem with Google Classrooms. You can't put anything in there live, and which I don't understand why the goo can't do that because they're all about security, but there we are. The answer garden is the only one, it's just a link. So much for answer garden. I think the uh, assignment asks you to write about which one you picked and why you picked it. You know the rule, or you know the routine. Paragraph, three to five sentences. I, I closed down my uh, page. <laughs> okay. People in the great beyond, forgive me. I'll jump right back in. Take me a second here. I'm very excited about Wednesday. Um, let me show you why. Say what? You should favorite it. Yeah. But I have so many independent studies, so many that I'm running in the summer that oh lord the ad block people are out to get me right, let's double check on that put a lot of stuff in this you're going to write one paragraph three to five well written sentences describing your survey and why you chose it that's all okay You have a very sweet, soft voice, and I can't hear it. Oh. <clears throat> I thought we were supposed to put all the surveys in there. So can I just, I'll just display all of them and tell you which one's my yeah. favorite. Okay. <laughs> it's so easy to do. I think that's the point, right? It's easy to do. But also, this class should, is all about choice, Sydney. We're trying to give you ideas and let you pick what you want to do. And we all know how to do the text. I mean, we all put that word in my head. We all know how to do the link from the page over to live text. Do we need to show that again? No, Steve. Here's what we're doing Wednesday, and I think you're going to really enjoy this one. We're going to talk about student voice. Kristen does a really nice job in the book about talking about student voice and how kids need to have voices. Um, and we're going to be looking at, and again, this is what I probably should have done up there, Sydney. Is on this one I say use this or use this or use this. You're going to be looking at three different tools. One is called Pick to Chart. One is called um, Make Beliefs Comics, which is right up your social studies teacher. This is right up your alley. And then the last one is Storybird. Uh, Storybird has a very special place in my heart because I have done lots of storybirds and research on storybirds with kids. Uh, we did research with ESL kids using storybird uh, as a way for them to get into using English as a language. Storybird lets you create picture books. Heck, storybird will let you make a whole chapter book if you want to. Um, use storybird with a librarian. Um, and the ESL kids in the building, as well as the other kids, all made uh, Storybird books, and then they voted on what the best books were, and then they bought them, and they put them in the library, because you could actually get them. Oh, you know. cool. Yeah, it's cool. You know, librarians in elementary school have, just swim around in money because of all that, uh, when they sell the, you know, had the library uh, book sale and all that, library book fairs. So, and they're not expensive books. Yeah, a story bird, again, yeah, it's kind of like Padlet, it's kind of like one of my faves, but make beliefs comics, oh my God. You know, if your school doesn't have comic life available to them, pfft, this is free. You don't have to even have an account, you can just create. And then pick the chart, pick the chart is a very serious tool that kids can use to make uh, some really good stuff, infographics stuff. And they have now gone to free accounts where everything is available to you with a free account. You don't have to have the magic Steve Swan to get into it. Storybird, you will. You'll have to have the magic Steve Swan to get into it. But you can then go in, you can create your own class, and you can put your kids into it, yada, 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 yada. 
Questions for the day? That's a pretty good time. I will be here, as you know. If you want to stay here with me and knock this out, you go right ahead. If you want to wave goodbye, grab yourself something on the grab out of the bottle and head out the door. Those of you who are in the great beyond, I uh, hope you were able to stay with us today. We did a lot of jumping around. And Brittany bailed me out here toward the end. And I had <laughs> I had a senior moment with Mentimeter. I hope we got that straightened out. And what do I say last always? As always, if you have questions, problems, comments, text me at 502-457-2937. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording for the day.